I'm Alana Jolie Abbott, Editor-in-Chief of Outland Entertainment. And with me today, I have Carlos Hernandez and CSE Cooney, who are not only fantastic writers of <laughs> many excellent titles, um, but they are also the game designers behind Negocios Infernales, which is coming out to on Kickstarter. Uh, it could be out right now by the time they see this video. <laughs> We're time traveling. <laughs> I would love to hear, I know that when people actually get a chance to read the rule book, they will hear some of the gritty behind the scenes, like storytelling of how this game came to be. Uh, but for people who have not had any tangible connection with the game yet, um, first, give me the elevator pitch. Tell me what is Negocios Infernales? All right, so first of all, thanks so much. Alana for being our editor on this project and being so awesome, <laughs> so, so pleasurable to have such you know good editing on the uh, on the rule book as we've been developing it with you. Negocios and Fidnales is so if we're doing the elevator pitch. I like to say that it's the Spanish Inquisition interrupted by aliens. So <laughs> basically, uh, what happens is that well-meaning aliens see a planet that is going to fall down the terrible road of a, of a Spanish-style Inquisition. So they forego anything resembling a prime directive and interfere. <laughs> uh, they dive right in and they're like, don't do this, please. And then, you know, the, the, the people of that time, they have no concept of aliens. They have no concept of, you know, outer space life or anything like that. And so they use the metaphors they can. And so they say, are you devils? And <laughs> the aliens like, okay, we'll, we'll work within your worldview. Sure. Yes, we're devils, but we're going to help you. And they're like, oh, we're going to help us. So we have to sell our souls to you in order for us to gain uh, magical powers. Is that it? And they're like, close enough. Uh, <laughs> we'll, 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 we'll figure it out along the way. So basically, these aliens are trying to help humans not be their own worst enemies. And humans are insisting on being their own worst enemies. You play as we so as often do. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You play as a wizard who is under the mistaken notion that you sold your soul to a devil for powers. And then you play with those powers to try to better your world. And hopefully along the way, you learn moral lessons. You don't learn moral lessons. Sometimes you do. But if you do, the aliens will take you up into the uh, cosmic consciousness and you can become one with the universe. It's excellent. Yeah. Well, that rarely, true. rarely happens <laughs> but... in a game. But it could. It could. Yeah. yeah. So well, I want to say one of the things that is my favorite, having playtested this now a few times, um, is that failing is just as fun as succeeding. I love that. And I don't think that's the case in many games. When you, when you designed it, was that part of the intention? This one. Thousand percent. He loves failing forward. Yeah, because like in a role playing game in general, if you play a role playing game, you might fail and it might feel like you're not accomplishing your goals, but it is often the most hilarious and most fun moments in those games. So we wanted to even bring that more to the forefront in this game and make it a, an absolute feature and an expectation. You know, basically when you're playing this game, you have something like, depending on where you are in the game and where the deck is, something like a 55 to 57 percent chance of you know, basically getting what you want, which, you know, is more or less a coin toss. <laughs> so you have to be ready for lots of failure all the time. And then the fun is playing it out, you know, to see what happens. I think as long so as you're, you're advancing the narrative, which you do by um, looking at these tarot-like cards with a beautiful image and then a weird saying, and you kind of interpret that card to to mean the success or the failure and it, you know they're highly interpretable like many oracle cards and can go either way but as long as it's you know rich and as long as it's like wild it's right whether or not it's a success or failure it's a good story that way so claire i imagine because i know before this you were not a gamer yeah. um that storytelling aspect i think must be part of the appeal for people who maybe didn't come to this through other rpgs well, yeah, because I was, I'm primarily a writer and I'm an actor. And so the idea of role playing for fun sounded like work. Like it <laughs> didn't sound like fun. And so I, I really had a strong um, wall up and Carlos really wanted to uh, take that wall down. He wanted to give me my gateway game as it were. And so one of his early ideas for the mechanics was making it, you know, taking out the dice rolls and the math but but you know dice rolls i've since learned can be awfully fun but the 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 card 
I already found like cards beautiful and fun. I liked like Mysterium and I liked Dixit. So, and I, and I've, you know, long been um, interested in tarot for many reasons, you know, uh, not necessarily oracularly, but I find them um, beautiful, evocative, beautiful and evocative mm -hmm. and, and weird and part of our, our like history and mythos and our history of, of game making and, I don't know. It's part of our weird human history. So it's all very fascinating. So it was already fun to flip a card, look at it and think about it to me. And it and it really did lead me into, you know, things like D&D, &D, which I had not heretofore in the 41 years of my life played. Um, but now super fan. So it actually works. So it's a really good game for people who have never played role playing games before, who have had bad experiences, who have not liked it. It's um, it doesn't have a, a DM. So there's no one telling you what to do. There might be someone who has read the rule book and knows how to guide the players through the game. But everything is built together, the world building the decisions, the characters, every all information is plain to all the players and there's nothing hidden or mysterious but the the characters may not know what's going on so there's a great deal of dramatic irony on many levels that is sly and hilarious and it just keeps getting weirder and wilder and building what what we mostly had to do is put constraints on it to make it gamic rather than sandboxy <laughs> Well, and I think that, you know, the characters may not always be collaborating with each other. They can certainly come to a head. But as players, you're a team in creating this story in a way that I think uh, it's possible in other role playing games to be a little more combative with your fellow gamers. And here it's very much more about coming together and telling a story. Um, and I think yeah. that's very welcoming. It, it's really very much a dramatic irony simulator in that like what it's really trying to do is put everyone a little bit in the place of the player and a little bit in the place of the dm so that you know you get a taste of both sides of it at the same time wherever you are in the game and it turns out to be just like a really interesting mix and people with no background in improv or games um we wanted to give them a great deal uh, of structure to like if they draw a blank or they have that that frozen decision. They, we wanted them to feel that both in the deck of cards, they had something to look at and to think about and interpret something solid. And the ability to ask their players, their fellow players, I'm drawing a blank. Do you have any ideas? And then you get five or six voices giving ideas, whether or not the player uses any of it, it's something to kind of chafe against and sort of get them back into the mm -hmm. zone, which I think is nice. <laughs> So I think very familiar gamers will be wondering, what about the NPCs? What about the non-player characters? Um, you, can you talk about those for just a minute? <laughs> Sure, yeah. So, you know, there's a whole NPC system that's basically like each scene has a protagonist that will be one of the players. And then if you're not the protagonist of a given scene, uh, you can play your own wizard, but you could also play NPCs. And in fact, to win the game, uh, you have to play at least once as an NPC. Each player is required to play as an NPC at least once. So you make up characters. They might be super plot bearing to the moment. They might be the villain, or they just might be some colorful flavor that you're adding in to a moment. They might know? be a talking cow. Uh, as, as, <laughs> yeah, we recommend talking cows. I'm <laughs> sorry, have you had a talking cow? Has that happened at a table yet? We had a talking cow with the game that we played with you. I don't know if you remember it, but there was a talking on the enchanted cow. isle. Yeah, on the enchanted <gasps> isle. There yes, was, there was a talking cow. So, you know, uh, we recommend it. Uh, talking cow basically is a formula for greatness in all role playing games. And an NPC. So you have all created your own characters together. So you have a kind of an in depth look of how to create a complicated character. So an NPC is a breeze in comparison. You draw one card from the deck. You give them a name, an occupation, and one weird thing about them, and then you put the like that together and you like in a little stand. And anybody after that can play them. Leave it on the table, and they're playable characters for anybody needing one. Or if you need a different character, you just make it up on the spot. So by the time you get to uh, the storytelling part where you're making up characters, it's almost second nature. And everybody mm -hmm. makes their first NPC altogether, which is the Queen of Espada, this land that we're in. Everybody collaborates to give her what kind of queen she is, answer these questions about her, so that you have like a non-player character um, st like structure to build on, basically. Exactly. You learn how to do it by building your, your surrogate Queen Isabella, basically. Excellent. Well, I...
think we should leave people wanting more. So <laughs> for now, we're going to say goodbye. And I'm going to recommend that people check out our Kickstarter page, um, as well as I think we are planning to have some tutorials, live streams, videos. So you can check out a lot more about Negocios Infernales and back us on Kickstarter because this is going to be such a fun game to play. I'm so excited about it. Thank you so much for chatting with me today. Thanks Thank a lot. you.